Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Whiskey Wednesday Weekly. Uh, this is episode number two. I am joined by one of my dearest friends. Um, I've known him pretty much since we both moved to uh, Valley Center, uh, Alex Stryler. We are actually in his own personal wine cellar that he built in his backyard. Uh, we'll get into that story a little bit later. Uh, but first, I just want to take a second to uh, thank everyone for tuning in to episode one, and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy this episode as well. Um, I will give you a little bit of story about Alex. We just met pretty much, what, 11, 12 years ago when our boys were four. Uh, they're 17 now, so I guess that's 13 years ago. Yeah, that's back in the T-ball um, for the Valley Center Little League. So um, with no further ado, um, I'll hand it over to Alex just to give you a quick introduction of him, who he is, where he's from as a child, and then we'll do our first shot. Okay? Alex. I have to talk before we do the shot? Yes. Oh, yeah. Just a couple of seconds. All right. I'm Alex, Alex Stryler. I have uh, four kids, wife Tammy. We live in Valley Center. Uh, I was born in Germany. My dad is, uh, was a retired military, so I'm an army brat. My mom um, was a very smart lady who was, came over here with me on her arm, literally, I think I was one years old, yeah. two years old. And she spoke very little English. Dad was in Vietnam at the time, and mom survived. So mom's German? Mom is German. Oh, okay. I was born okay. in Germany, and then That's where back they and met. forth a few okay. times. Got it. So, cool. And do you have any siblings? I have two brothers, uh -huh. but uh, the, the army brat's key because when you're an army brat or any military brat, okay. you don't live in one place. Oh, yeah, You move all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think by the, we counted once, and I think by the time I was 30 years old, I had 33 different houses. Oh. Not homes, houses. Right, right, right. So about every 12 to 18 months, we would move huh. when I was younger, and then college I moved many yeah, times. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. That's interesting, because usually Army, you're stationed for a couple of years, but he was just always on the move, huh? So, so the longest I've ever been in one place is here, Valley okay, Center. Of course. The longest I've ever known people in one place right. here, like yourself. Of course. And, and your family. Yeah. And it was very, it was one of the things I really wanted to do. Is, it, was, it was very important to me to make sure that my kids were able to grow up in a one house for their whole life without having to move a lot. Makes sense because you were so used to moving, it wasn't really your favorite thing to do, I'm assuming. It, yeah. You know, it was the only thing I knew, so I didn't. Of course. But you learn a lot, <laughs> right. and then you meet a lot of people, you learn how to adapt. Right. But yeah, there's never a place you can call home. Right. And so it, there's nice knowing during Christmas or holidays or anything that there's a place you can go and it's home. Right. And home was my grandma's house, right, right. never our house. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted our kids to have a home. That's why we settled down here at Valley Center. Cool. We had two kids when we moved here. We were in Pennsylvania at the time. Oh. And so they were already born over there, and then you. I oh, gotcha. Okay. Cool. Lexi was cool. two. Cole was about six months old. We yeah. Moved here, and then Zach and Will were both born. Cool. But okay. been in the same house uh, almost the whole time. Yeah. Well, good. Well, we're not going to get wasted. Uh, waste any time. We are going to get wasted. <laughs> we're not going to waste any time. We're going to have a first shot just to loosen the mood a little bit, uh, and we're going to go start with uh, not something you normally start with, Johnny Walker Black. Uh, but as a whiskey connoisseur and a whiskey fan, I kind of pretty much collect them all, look at them all, have them all, and I just choose six different ones every week. So with that being said, here we go. Let's shoot off to some Johnny Cheers. Walker Black. Cheers. That's smooth. That's good. <laughs> Better than no. For me. <laughs> He's coughing already. For me. No, all the rest I've done, That's I've never bad. shot That's that. It's bad. really good. I mean, it's high in whiskey. But that one's got a little bit of an afterburn. Yes, I have a wine cellar, but I'm a whiskey guy. <laughs> yes, that's another reason why I have them on. My mother last week was not a whiskey guy, but she enjoyed it. But Alex actually shares that in common with me. And another reason I really wanted to bring Alex on for everyone who's watching it early to hopefully you'll keep watching the whole video is because to me, Alex is, to me, I mean, I've had one job for most of my adulthood uh, after the Navy, and I've been with the company for 20 years. Alex, to me... Um, I hate to, I don't know how to use that word, but he, um, what is that word I'm looking for? You're just an amazing guy who can pretty much do anything. I mean, he can work at a corporate level, he can come home and write books and go to the desert house and write for three weeks and come out with books and then make those sell and then live on royalties from books enough to get him another job at a corporate level. He's just always been to me the most interesting man in the world. I mean, I like, I compare him to the guy for the Dos Equis commercial. Um, you know, he kind of looks like a little like him too. Uh, he, uh, he's just, that's one of the reasons I wanted him to come on because of his success. Um, and I know there's always failure with success. And so he's got a little bit of that to talk about, but ultimately he always just seems to end up on his feet. So it may have a lot to do with his wife. And supporting him all these years, hundred percent, yeah, hundred uh, percent. We definitely <laughs> want to give shout out to hold that. Up for the ride. Yeah, but uh, I definitely want to get into his story a little bit. So after the first shot, we'll go ahead and oh, now that we did that, we'll start with. Tell me a little bit about um, your your kind of teenage through 
uh, college years. What happened there when you went to college? Where did you go to college, first of all? I went to Cal Poly Pomona. Okay. And uh, that was actually the second college I went to. I was uh, a geek in high school, had straight A's, got good grades, but I went to junior high school in Oklahoma, mm. and then moved, I know that and about moved to high school in uh, you know, 11th and 12th grade in Pennsylvania. And when you're a straight-A student in a little town in Oklahoma, and then you go to a suburb of Philadelphia right. and a really nice school, um, I was blown away. I, I had no idea what algebra was, calculus, geometry, <laughs> oh, okay. trigonometry. Everybody was so advanced and ahead of me that I was getting C's and D's and F's. Mm. I, I really had a hard time keeping up. But I uh, got the grades up, and I was able to get into Drexel University, which is... Great school. Yeah, from school the East Philly. Coast. Yeah. And I thought I was going to be prepared. I went to Drexel as a computer electronic engineer. That was the major, and I could not handle it. Um, I was not ready. Uh, the Oklahoma didn't, didn't prepare me for it. Right, and right. what I learned in, the, in high school, I, I had no idea. Right, I, I right. went there, and I literally flunked out. Mm. All D's and F's, so I quit that program. And I had a four-year scholarship as well, oh. which I lost. Wow, I yeah, of course. <laughs> it makes sense. So all my friends are now going on to their sophomore year of college, mm -hmm. and I drop out, and I had to establish residency somewhere to go. I had to find a school to go to, oh. and I figured, I want to move to California. My, my dad was now stationed at Fort Irwin, so the family had moved to, to California. Did I say Oklahoma? California. No. He started uh -huh. there, but he's now in California. Yeah, okay. So dad moved to California in the 80s, and... After my first year at Drexel, I knew that I had to reestablish residency somewhere so I could be a state resident. Of course. I wanted to do California so I could go to school here. Okay. So I became a cable TV man. <laughs> Did you really? I climbed cable. I love that because I'm learning about things I didn't know. At the United States National Training Center. is a yeah, the National Training Center at Fort Irwin. Okay. Uh, north of Barstow. It's 45 miles southeast of Death Valley. Okay. Or southwest so of Death Valley. So is Cal State Pomona here? In California? Yes. It's okay, in, so in that's where you went. Okay, I'm not a, I, for, I thought it was, yeah. but when you said you started in Philly. I, right, I had to work for one year right. on, on post, right. on the military post, okay. as a cable TV man. I climbed yeah. up, back then you had gas, and you yeah. climb up telephone poles yeah. and hook up cable and, yeah. and, a real, and like, went into the barracks. And I, you know, everybody in the barracks was always stealing TV, so <laughs> half the time I had to disconnect. I was always right, in the back right, right, right. Um, and then after establishing residency, I went to Cal Poly, became a business major, which is what I pr much prefer. Of I'm course. an engineer, I'm yeah. a business guy, and I loved it. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I met Tammy. We got so married. Tammy was from here? Tammy, or, we, okay. we met my, our last year at Cal Poly. Oh, nice. Well, good good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so exactly. you went to Cal Poly after Cal State Pomona? Or, uh, so... Cal State Pomona is Cal Poly. Oh, I'm sorry. California State Polytechnic Institute. Oh, okay. Name. So gotcha. Cal Poly. Okay, okay. What's funny is when I later on in my professional career, when I worked in New York City, I would tell people I went to Cal Poly. Yes. And they confuse it with Caltech. Okay. Not to be confused. Confused. Yeah, yeah, Caltech yeah. is like MIT. Cal Poly is just oh, it's a state school. It's a state school. Yeah, yeah. It's like Penn yeah. State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good okay. school. But okay. But uh, everybody's like, oh, he went to Cal Poly. Right, 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 right. I didn't right. correct anybody, of course. Yeah, why not? Why yeah. tell live it up. Live it up. Yeah. So then from there, you got your degree in business. Yes. You graduated actually with finance. a business degree. Finance. And then you then did what? Did you go back east? I was a finance uh, major with a marketing minor. Okay. I always liked marketing and I was just good with numbers. Numbers in terms of um, data. Not, not debits and credits so right. much, but uh, seeing how numbers relate to a business. Okay. Profitability and okay. efficiency and productivity. That, yeah. That's more my, my thing than... Uh, being an accountant. Sure. Yeah. But what I did stuff. is I got a job as almost as a, an accountant right after college. I mm -hmm. got a job as an auditor. Okay. So I audited for a lending company. Okay. Yeah, mine's empty too. <laughs> That's all right. We'll just sit on the ice and do a shot. Tell you, I did not like that either. I can imagine. That's like kind of a desk job, right? Well, no. You have to go out into the field. Okay. To so asset based lending is when companies need to finance their working capital because they don't have enough cash flow okay. to operate the business. So they okay. borrow from an asset-based lender. Okay. And the asset-based lender has collateral. Okay. Usually it's receivables, right. or inventory, or cash, or anything, right. assets that are, that are liquid, liquidatable, right. um, current assets. Okay. And so I would go into companies and see how much their liquid assets are, mm -hmm. if it was good for the collateral that we were loaning them. Right. And, and when the cash flow came in, when they got invoices paid, then that had to go to pay off the loans that we were giving it. Oh, so that's okay. the lending. All right. So I was the auditor for companies that were kind of struggling, and, and you, there's a small percentage of them that typically are not not running the books correctly. Right, so right. probably one in ten companies that I would audit, I would find something very wrong, a okay. discrepancy. Gotcha. And uh, one day I walked into a company, the guy was making little microchips and circuits, and 
And I knew instantly, because you can always tell by the way they treat you. Of course, you. yeah, yeah. I walk in, I'm in a suit and tie. Right. I think I'm like 22 years old, maybe 23 yeah. or something. And I had a very young face at the of time. Course. So I'd, sometimes I wore fake glasses. Oh, really? Just to just look, look older. older, yeah. They made me look five years older. So instead of looking 12, I looked 17 at the time when I'm already. But uh, I went into a company once, and the owner greets me at the door, and he looks, and he goes, Oh, my God, you have big feet. Look at your feet. Hey, everybody, the auditor has big feet. And I haven't even walked into business yet. And everybody's coming over now to the door. And they're looking at my feet in size 10 shoes. And I'm thinking, I'm, you're like, that's not I'm, I'm, I'm like, really? I got big feet on? And you just realize he's, he's, he's trying to deflect, to right? From the very beginning. Oh, okay. So that same day, just a few hours later, right. they had a company lunch in the, I guess it was the cafeteria, the kitchen, right, whatever, right, whatever right. it was. And there was a lot of people there. They had a party. And they had pizza and cake and it was somebody's birthday party, so he's like, hey, auditor, come here. He didn't know my name. Yeah. Auditor, come here. <laughs> and, you know, I, I feel the like that's how they all get treated oh, at some man, point. It was, terrible. <laughs> it, was terrible. It, was, it was really rough. Yeah, you know? yeah. So right was that, out of college. Was that kind of that. the end where, um, you know, you ended up deciding to get an MBA and go into something else? It was shortly thereafter, yeah. So but, what's an MBA? But check this out. So, so on the pizza thing, oh, okay. this, this is even better because they, they never stop messing with you when you when there's something wrong with the company. I got they it. Wanted, yeah. They wanted to turn your, your They're invention. deflecting. Totally, yeah. So, so the guy, this the, the owner of the company, I can't remember his name, he's like, auditor, come here, come here, here, have a plate. He hands me a plate. So I grab it. I'm like, okay. Here, have a pizza. Hands me a pizza. Puts it on the plate. I grab it. Hands me a fork. Grab the fork. The second that fork was in my hands, mm -hmm. he screams at the top of his lungs, Hey, everybody! Everybody, look! The auditor eats pizza with a fork! The whole place starts laughing. Oh, my God. And I'm standing there with, with <laughs> swear to God. He's I'm just, like, like oh setting you God. up for failure based oh, on embarrassment. Oh, I nailed his ass, yeah. Oh, you're oh, like, you're like don't do him. that, oh, buddy. Don't he, <laughs> he had two sets of books, one right. for us, which right. were fake, and then one... Which are the real books, right? And I was lucky to find it, right? Right. And so and, you're like, that's why you you don't anyway, mess with them. Instead, be nice. He, he just made me mad. Like, yeah, at that point, I, I was gonna find something. If there's not anything you learn from that, anything. treat the auditors right. Yeah, yeah. yeah don't. don't and I was like that a lot. Like, Everywhere yeah. I went, you know, it was they were constantly messing. Yeah. One yeah. company made me sit in the middle of. They have a giant room with all these cubicles right, and desks, right, right. and they cleared out the center. Like the, the center right. spoke of a wheel, the center yeah. of the hub, and they put me right in the middle. And, and everyone all was the, right. everybody was facing me. <laughs> right. And I'm in the middle room. There's like 30 people all looking at me yeah. all day long. And Why I'm they're Obviously, trying to intimidate they're, you, basically. They're trying to hide something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're it's like, if anyone goes through that length, yeah. I realize, man, yeah. this is, I this don't is know. terrible. This You're is only like 20 some years old. So you, you hand someone a business card that says auditor, and the first thing they do is go, Ugh. Yeah, yeah. It's so definitely I, not an appealing thing. I didn't like that. I was like, you know what? I want to be liked a little bit. I was like, I'm getting back. I'm gonna go back to school, I'm gonna get an MBA, and I'm gonna go work on Wall Street. Everybody's okay. making money on Wall Street. Of course, like, that's what, what I was that? The 80s? Uh, yes, yes. So, was that the. There's the that, 80s. There's the that 80s. movie, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, I think it is. Yeah, that's a lot about stocks. But okay, yeah, okay. I was on the bond side. So, what were you doing? Bonds? Okay. I was okay. a fixed income, which are bonds, which okay. is equity, which are stocks. Right. And I was a high yield, which means junk. Okay. High yield is, you know, high interest rate. Sure. High yield, fixed income. Salesman, and I was an institutional okay. high yield fixed okay. income salesman, right. which means I only sold to banks, mutual funds, hedge funds. Okay, my clientele were institutions, not individuals. Is there any good stories there that you can remember? <laughs> oh, I mean, other than just <laughs> any we're we're get in trouble yeah, from? I mean, start, we got we yeah. got to keep this short, so not too so, short, but so so I actually got back then we had things called phone books. So Google didn't exist. We didn't even learn it back <laughs> just in, in case days. you're a kid. Don't know what yeah, that is. yellow pages, <laughs> big and, books. Uh, and well, when I first got the job. I got real lucky because the guy that hired me he says, he says, you know, we don't have a seat for you, but we'll hire you. Just go up there and find a milk crate. Find a milk crate to sit on. Right, right. Like, oh, whatever he means, you know. Yeah. I thought he was just fucking around, but he actually was serious. <laughs> was serious. I went to a trading floor my very first That's day of work, and I look around. Remember when he said pel sell penny stocks? Remember? When he just yeah, said, here. The, he was, no, I'm just it's saying the, it was very like, the, go to the bottom. The attitude is the same. Right, right, the exactly. Yeah, the securities yeah. were different. The right. attitude is the but same. But it's the same concept. Here, go find a crate and work. So I, I walked onto the trading floor. There's a... Thousand people uh -huh. all lined up in, in, in rows, literally, right. you know, from so you were on the floor where people like you see it on TV. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like yeah. on the real, oh, you were yeah. on the floor, we had <laughs> but we selling a different product, okay. Okay. API, everything. That must have been crazy, especially yeah. in the '80s. It was insane, yeah. <laughs> and especially your first day, not having a boss or yeah. And he just says, department. "Go figure it out." So I had to find a desk okay. or, or an empty chair along right. one of the rows where nobody was sitting. Right. Maybe that person was on vacation that week. <laughs> right, right. So I'm just bouncing You're around everywhere. Yeah. And you don't sit there. That guy's at lunch. You know? yeah. Don't sit there. Okay, yeah, he's gone for a week. Sit there. Get us coffee. Right. Well, that was the mortgage desk. Oh, okay. So it turns out I ended up on 
So back in those days, the mortgage market was a big market. Okay. CMOs, collateralized mortgage obligations. Okay. Um, Bear Stearns was one of the few companies that was. That's a big name. Writing, yeah. It was a big name. It was a fifth back, largest investment yeah, bank in the US at the time. Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. Lehman, Bear Stearns, yeah. and Merrill Lynch all went bankrupt in, yeah. in 90, or 2008. Was it 2008, yeah. But yes, I worked at Bear Stearns uh, on the mortgage desk. Okay. And I was selling. High yield? Well, high yield mortgages, um, they're called collateralized mortgage obligations, uh -huh. CMOs. And very difficult to understand, but yes. essentially Wait, you, you find this. a pool of securities, they get tranched out into different cash flows, right. and investors invest in those cash flows. It, right. It's very complicated, but that's a very short Quick. way of saying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While I was on that desk, um, another department was starting to do really well, and that's emerging markets. Okay. So emerging markets are usually second or third world countries that are starting to develop. Okay. And the emerging market desk needed some people. So my boss moved over to emerging markets, took me with him. Right. And now suddenly I joined the emerging markets desk. And it's funny because um, most of the emerging markets guys are all relatively new also. They, right. they all spoke different languages. Right. I spoke German, but the Germany is not an emerging market. Right, it's, right. It's so, its own thing, yeah, back then. But, but coming from the mortgage desk, I was treated with respect because it's like, oh, he's a mortgage. Right, right, right. Like, oh, he yeah. sells mortgage bonds. <laughs> yeah. But I literally got my accounts from walking. We, Tammy and I lived at, well, I think, uh, 55th Street. Uh -huh. And I walked down to 47th or so, which is where Bear Stearns is located. Okay. I just walk over a few, first, second, third, down Madison, or not Madison, uh, Lexington, over to Park Avenue, then south to, I want to say it's 46 or 47th where Bear Stearns was. It had the whole block. And I'd walk by banks, Allied Irish Bank, Trans right, Investment right. Bank, Banco Industrial de Venezuela. Mm -hmm. One day I decided, huh, I wonder if anybody's calling these. Right. All three banks on Park Avenue. Are you serious? BIV, Banco Industrial de right, Venezuela. Right. I looked in the yellow pages, cold called them. Right. And sure enough, they had a trading desk. Nobody was dealing with them from Bear Stearns. Oh my Same God. as Allied Irish Bank. Right. Same as TAIB, Trans yeah. Arabian Investment Bank. To this day, I'm still friends with the traders. This is 30 years later. Right. For the traders who traded right. and invested securities at BIV, wow. Tide, yeah. and at, well, Allied Irish Bank, I kind of lost yeah. touch with, with Tom McGinn, but he was my very first trade. Yeah. So he was a mortgage trade. I right. traded 10 million Freddie Max, uh -huh. H LMC, I think yeah. they were called. Yeah. It was a tranche of a CMO. Yeah. And uh, when my boss found out, he comes walking over, he grabs my tie, pulls it forward. I was like, oh shit, yeah. I'm in trouble. Yeah. Pulls out, he has scissors in his hand. I was like, what the? And he cuts my tie in half. Uh huh. Turns out, you know, a traditional Wall Street yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. first trade, they cut right. off your tie. Oh, okay. So I was like, ah, I still have it hanging in my office. Oh, right really? Now. That's yeah. cool. That's right cool. Now. So, so let's go back to, well, first of all, let's pause for a second and do another shot. Because we have to loosen up a little bit Hell more. yeah. So this is probably one of my wife's favorite. It's Evan Williams Single Barrel. It came as a recommendation from a whiskey book. So it's extremely smooth. I think you'll enjoy this. What do you think of that one over the first one? Oh, they're <laughs> <laughs> I know, that was me. <laughs> it's good. Uh, they're both good, yeah. But it's different flavor. I love black like yeah, Johnny Walker. I've never had Evan Williams before. It's single barrel, yeah. Okay. Normally, yeah, Evan yeah. Williams is something you'll find in like Petco Park for a, a good mixed drink, but single barrel is the top shelf. So nice. it's really good. Good to know. Um, so let's, let's uh, good stuff over skip again. forward, um, not past your Wall Street. So let me ask you this, and, and this is, again, without getting into too much detail. Wolf of Wall Street, you see a lot of women and drugs and stuff and i'm not going to ask that you what your stories are but it was it really like that in the 80s it's like any high school you get groups of people you uh -huh. got the quantitative smart people you right. got the crazy wild ones you right. got the the ones that are just looking to hook up with oh okay with, with, so know, there's constant sections party. and groups and stuff okay and, and so yes yes yeah. just okay. like that <laughs> the only the only difference is right it's those groups of people and right. they all have a lot of money that's the point, right? A High school, you don't have money. Here, have money. they have a yeah. lot of money, and they're just throwing it around like... I, I remember my first year when my father-in-law heard how much I was making. He right. looked at me and he says, do you realize that you've made more your first year than I've made in the past 10 years? Oh, man. Unreal. I was like, hmm. No? But, so you left that, though. How many years did that last in Wall Street? For the average person, it lasts six to seven years. Okay. And you get burnt out. So is that what you do it for? How long I did you... Seven years. Okay, so you were in that average, because it's I, extremely exhausting, yeah. right? It is, and it's, you know, you're selling things, and the only goal is profitability. And, right. And, and, and sometimes it conflicts with doing what's right and doing Correct. what you want to do and right. building and creating. Yes. And so after a while, it's like, you know, commissions, commissions, commissions. Yeah, it's great. You're making a lot of money, right. but there's, there's no, no satisfaction. Real, there's no satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. And you're just spinning so, your wheels. I mean, I kind of yeah. get that because I'm in sales, too, for 20-some years. So I get that. There, you want to kind of offer something of a little bit of value. 
Right, not just and, kind of feel like you're always just selling someone the, and the at latest. At the same degree. time, there was this thing called the internet that was starting to happen. Okay, we good, were starting to good. use this thing called email. Okay, and we were starting to communicate through. First, it was uh, I don't want to say it was Netscape created Mosaic. Yeah. you know these yeah. online Netscape. browsers, yeah, yeah. and we were able to start communicating. And instead of having to use a fax machine and photocopier and copy a prospectus to send it to a potential buyer, because right. we were doing a new issue. Right. Here's a good example. The national bank or uh, the country of Pakistan was doing okay. a bond issue. All right. You have to love the irony of this. Right. Wall Street underwrites Pakistan. Okay. Think of the different cultures. <laughs> right. You know, and, right. So Bear Stearns uh -huh. underwrote the bonds for the country of Pakistan. Nobody wanted odd. to buy them. None of, none of our accounts. You know, right. Solomon Asset Management was one of my accounts. Right. They're like, yeah, no. <laughs> We're not touching Pakistan. Right. So I pulled out the yellow pages and I'm like, Pakistan. Oh, National Bank of Pakistan. Right. I call them up. They literally bought, I, I forget how much it was, but how much, how many bonds they bought. Right. But I remember my commission was about $80,000. Oh my gosh, that's insane. And I was like, whoo hoo, not bad. <laughs> and in the 80s, <laughs> or late, late 80s, yeah, early this, 90s, this whatever. Is, yeah. That's insane. Early 90s, one, early sale. 90s. one sale. One yeah, sale. That's, that's insane. Yeah, yeah. That, now I can see why your but, father in law said that. And then my boss looked at me and was like, oh, are you fucking serious? <laughs> if you had another tie, we cut that too. So. I know, especially if you're yeah. going around cold calling <laughs> these other banks that you still have relationships with. Just from the It was so easy. It was yeah, so yeah. easy. And no one ever did that stuff. And that's what I'm saying. You were kind of already outside of the box. So um, you, you took that on, and you left that, but, and what made you, you know, well, so, so this thing that was happening was internet, yeah. and I saw an opportunity with internet. This guy named Jeff Bezos started com this company called Amazon, and it was starting to sell books online, and right. we, That's we started to see, books. Yeah. we started to see commerce, and I was like, you know, this is interesting, because uh -huh. he's selling books, there's no, there's no shelf life on a book, it lasts forever, right. you don't break during shipping, you can't get damaged unless it falls in water, perhaps, right, right, there's... It's it's very durable, obviously, and it it's easy. So I started thinking, well, what else could you sell online right. that's non-perishable, non-breakable? Because right. you have to ship everything. Right. And I started thinking, well, you know, the the kids, the children market is growing up, and skateboards are becoming very popular, at least on the West Coast. Yeah. So yeah, that was like Tony Hawk era, probably maybe exactly, or at least exactly. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right after yeah. Tony Hawk. Uh, Tony Hawk, I think, was late nineties. Yeah, they, they, well, I graduated in '89, exactly. so he was in his '80s, but he was definitely already a mogul at that well, point. Well, Tony, so Tony was with yeah. Bird House. Yeah, he, he was already selling his yeah. brand. Yeah. He had done the 900 that. by yeah. then. He, I think he did the 900 in the late '90s. But, right, right. But around 1996, I incorporated a company. Okay. That was going to become the next Amazon. It okay. was going to become a combination of what today is Facebook and Amazon. Right. It was a online portal that would sell brands through a community of like-minded. Subscribers or okay. users. Okay. And we called it Bocus Month. Huh. So Bocus you even Mom. had thought up of the whole subscriber kind of like, you know, people well, that are like on a regular basis. Yeah, right, right, right. And, yeah. and it was a skateboarding community. Right. Uh, the action sports community. Correct. Youth. Okay. Right. And that, that's what we're targeting is because, you know, what do I know about fishing? Nothing. <laughs> I don't know anything about right, knitting. Right, right. You know? <laughs> what I know is yeah. you know, I, I know my kids right. now and I see what they're involved yeah, with. Yeah. My passion was those motorcycles and dirt bikes. So I it's created. extreme sporting. But, but you can't sell motorcycles and dirt bikes at that time on the internet, and right? You can't say the word extreme anymore. It's like, it's like the N-word in action sports. Oh, you have to say action sports, okay. not extreme sports. I apologize. Tony Hawk killed that action. Back, back in the late 90s. Okay. He actually pleaded to the media, please don't use the word extreme. Oh, okay. Got it. But yes, that, that was happening. Right. And, and they still use the word. It was okay. like an extreme sports club online on LinkedIn. So what was like, the name of that company? Bogus Smoke. Okay. Now, I thought it was clever because it rhymed with smokable. Okay. And, and obviously back then, weed prevalent. And back then, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. not yet legal. Yeah. So it was still a little bit edgy. You right. Know? When, when, you, when you want to do something new, you have to be different and edgy. Right. And you have to create something that is not already there. Yeah. You know, and if you compete with everybody else, then only one can be the low-cost provider. Leader. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else has to compete on the quality of the brand. Right. And so you have to have a different brand. Okay. So ours was going to be a cool, funky, hip, new, online community where youth could buy skateboards right. or anything involved in action sports. Okay. We had for a while, so actually, uh, not snowboards, uh, surfboards. Really? Yeah, it really was. So you were actually, let, let's, let's, so you actually got this off the ground. It wasn't so, just an idea at one time. So it, I, I incorporated it in 96. Okay. And I created three characters, Bo, Kaz, and Mo. Hired an illustrator, and he created a series of comics. For okay. Bo was bad, Kaz was crazy, and Mo was cool. Okay. And there were three cartoon characters uh -huh. that each had an attitude that, that catered to three different personalities of kids, okay. of youth. And that was sort of going to be the way I reached them was with the comics and 
And That's pretty cool. By 1998, two years two in, years I in. realized, ooh, this is going to go somewhere. Oh so I left God. Wall Street. Oh, okay. Moved to California, ran Boca Smo full time. From where? Your house? Uh, initially, like a warehouse no, or? no, I had a, we had a, we first got a small skate shop in Oceanside. Oh, cool. But the, you know, we started in Oceanside, Oceanside yeah. then I, I expanded, moved over to Carlsbad, got another shop, and then... So you were actually like a storefront. You could actually come yes, in. Yes, it wasn't yes, just yes, internet. Yes, okay. Because yes. you want to sell your brand. Internet and was still very new. Very yeah. few people were buying of course. online. So you actually had so storefront. I had product. inventory that I would sell to kids who'd walk in the yeah, door, yeah, yeah. but I was trying to sell mostly online. Right. Because you want to go there. Online yeah, was, yeah, that, that's yeah. where we saw things were going. My right. mistake was okay. not getting on big enough partners soon enough. I financed everything on my own. Mm. I had, at one point, I think we had seven employees working mostly part-time. Right. And everything was just coming out of the bank account that I had saved from Wall Street. Right. And, and I thought I was going to have partners here in California right. that could work on their own and help build the business, right. but they needed an income, so okay. I actually had ended up paying my partners. Oh. And then the partners still wanted half, and I was like, well, hey, hold on. If I'm paying you for right. the work, right. and, and, and you're getting half the business, right. Right. It's, 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 it's now we're going broke. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so shit hit the fan around, what's that noise? Sounds like someone's walking wow. on top of our it does, right? Yeah, That's yeah. never heard that. Well, we are. Our, it's collapsed. How, how, many, shit? how many feet down are we? I mean, from the dirt. I don't know. The floor or the ceiling is at least nine feet. There's right. A few so feet there's a that, couple so. feet about that. Yeah. So yeah. we're we're actually underground, kind of in a bunker, except it's a cool ass wine cellar. So, so let's. So it started going downhill, and then when did that actually pretty much end? Other than when you had some left. I'll say around two thousand three is when it, I realized it lasted from ninety eight to two thousand three. Well, in two thousand one, when when the twin towers fell. Right. And, and I, I was in New York okay. in August. I think, Where are you I think really? it was August of 2001. It was about six or seven weeks before September, September 11th. 11th. Wow. And I was on a road show. Oh I presented goodness. to four or five people who I knew, right. friends and banks. Right. I was pitching to them. Why the internet? Bogus Mo. Wow. I, I created a private placement memorandum for Series A Preferred. I was trying to sell, I think it was like 4.2 million shares of stock. Or yeah. Raise, Raise about $10 million. I forget the exact public, amount. Or? I, I gave shares to a lot of friends of mine who were involved and helped me get it to that level. Got it. A lot of people on Wall Street sort of encouraged sure, them. Sure, sure. Um, so I don't know what happened, but when September 11 hit, commerce, e-commerce came to a screeching halt. Perhaps because right. the anthrax that was right. happening. Oh, that's true. That was a yeah, Anthrax yeah. Was, was hidden, but nobody was buying online. Got and it. And since that was now a majority of my business model, I remember the accountant comes to me one day, and I forget her name, Mandy or... Something like that. She comes and she goes, you know, we only have about 100000 left in the bank account. You probably have 30 days before you're broke. Right. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> now what do I do? <laughs> you got a family so, of freaking <laughs> six going on, too, at this um, time. Yeah, no, that, that, was, at that point, too. It was two. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, two. Yeah. But, but I had employees. Yeah, employees. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, when you got a hundred grand in the bank trying to, trying to run right. a business, that's right. not really that much money. Yeah. So we cut back a lot. I survived another two years until 2003 when I realized, yeah, this is not going to work. Wow. It's not coming back. I should have raised the money sooner or right. earlier. Right. And it just didn't we, we completely exploded or imploded. Right. And uh, we went totally broke. We had no money. We moved oh, back in with our my parents in Carlsbad. <laughs> Cam and I moved into their living room. Right. And we had room dividers right. sectioning off the living room where our bed was set. Yeah. And the kids you know. were in there and everything. <laughs> it was like that, I've been in the house. It's like, like that a, big for no, like no, an extra not, four people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like me and a cable TV man all over again. Going to college and bam, you know, dropping out. Here you are, got big dreams for five years being this internet mogul pretty much and then boom, all of a sudden. When we bought our house in Pennsylvania, like in the middle of Wall Street, my friend Johnny Lupo came down from New York. He came to visit. And as... I was waiting outside yeah. on the street because right. you know he's, he's he was from the Bronx, but he was also a, uh, a stock trader actually, and so he was not very familiar with the Philly suburbs. Right. So I was waiting outside in front, and as he pulls up to my my house, he looks up and goes, "Which one is it?" Yeah. I said, no, the whole thing's mine, John. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's my house. That was the big, you had like <laughs> a big it, it mansion. Like, we went mystery. from a yeah. Yeah, really nice house to living, living in my in dad's living room <laughs> now, in the, a matter of a few years. Let me stop you there because I'd like to get your mindset, your wife's mindset, before we move on to like your next stepping point. Uh, what was she, I mean, because obviously she was living a high life. How does she, other than love and trust, did she buy into this internet thing and just never, supported you? Uh, never, no. Oh, she thought okay. it was crazy. Okay. She never, <laughs> Which it turns she out never, kind she of worked. never saw yeah. that in yeah, those right. days. She supported me, but she, right. never, she never quite saw it. Okay. And I went, at the end, when I really needed help, because I couldn't pay for help anymore, right. you know, but I needed things to get done. I was right. trying to pull her in and recruit her. 
she's a teacher, so now I'm taking a teacher who's right. who's teaching all day long. Right. And then she comes home and you know, yeah. you just want her unwind and relax. Yeah. And, and she's trying to manage the family. Be like a friend. Now I'm, you need to be the accountant. Business marketing. Like, right, 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 right. Right. So yeah, that didn't I got work you. Out. Okay, okay. But I learned a lot, and what was really cool is I learned the industry. Which is what so we're it was trying like, to learn it was here. Education. For yeah, me. yeah. I lost all my money. Right. I ended my career because I wasn't going to go back to Wall Street. I okay. could have, but right. I, I just didn't want to. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to stay in California. Our parents were here, and, and I was not giving up on the internet. Internet is okay. Back then, oh, I yeah, still two thousand three. Yeah. I mean, that was early on. It's crazy. So I like to it, it, it's like kind of capture that moment of what he just said. I mean, this is a guy who went from probably making I don't know I would say five hundred to a, you know something in the high. Six figures for sure. To taking a risk on the internet, which was new at the time, he saw it before anyone else did, uh, or at least a few other people did, and then went all the way down again. So I want to make sure we really don't take that for granted. I want people to understand that, you know, this is when people say, "Wow, what happened?" You know, this is his true story. So this is why I wanted to bring him on. So before we get into the next level, let's take another shot. <coughs> Buffalo Trace. I don't even have to say a lot about that. That's it's nice one of my one. favorite ones. That's your favorite. Mm. Yeah, I, like I don't that. know why I'm having. That's I'm, good. It's good. It's good. I'm just needing my ice. <laughs> anyway, classic. So from there, let's go from Carlsbad, living at your parents. Then what happened to get that corporate job again? Like, how did you go back up again? Well, I knew I had to go back in the job. I had to get a job because I couldn't start a business at that point. I had no money. I okay. did continue to try to get financing from Wall Street. I didn't give up on that. Okay. But I never got it. You got you know? it. Yeah. So and investors need at to some see point you got to move on. Yeah. 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 We had like a million point one in sales. It was just, it was not enough for anybody that wanted to invest right. you know, any serious money in. Correct. So I realized I had to get, you know, go back into the workforce. I'd heard about, uh, uh, one of the cool action sports shoe companies that was sort of needed some financial assistance, so okay. I became the CFO for them. It was Osiris. You just Shoes. applied for the job and got well, it. Now somebody through a mutual friend. Okay. Mutual friend said, "Hey, you should talk to them." Right. They said, "Hey, talk to him." We they connected yeah. us, and next thing you know, like a week later, I was their CFO. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, I realized they, they it was a, it was a good group of guys, some skiers right. and, and surfers who started a business and created a shoe company okay. that suddenly went from their garage to fifty million in sales. Kind of like you were trying to do with both smell, right? <laughs> exactly. What I was trying to do. Exactly. That's why I really respect what yeah, they were doing. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were in the right market. Right. They just didn't have that financial backing right. and that experience. So I had that. Okay. They brought me on as the, the finance guy to sort of help hopefully clean up the books. Right. And a few months later, the creditor, there was, there was some creditor issues. I became president of the company. All within and, a few weeks. Uh, you were a few, few months. Oh, okay. A few months. Oh, okay. few months. It was yeah. within a year. Yeah, yeah, within a year. Yeah. Wow. And, 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 and then, then all of a sudden, a friend of mine who I went to grad or undergrad and grad school with, coincidentally right. both, and I, you know, a good friend of mine, I stayed in touch with him. He was right. a, a, a fraternity brother, right? You know, and, and of I, course. smart guy. He calls up one day and he says, "You know, I know that you're over there in the shoe industry." Right. He says, "But uh, I just got a job in the racing industry." And I'm like, "Ooh, racing! That sounds kind of fun." Like, what he kind says, of racing? You know, car? He was off road, off road racing. Okay. He okay. he became. He, he was hired by a real estate developer who bought an off-road racing series called Core Championship Off-Road of Racing. Of course, yeah. And so he called me up and says, you know, you know, our revenue at that time, you know, was sort of hovering somewhere between twenty-five and fifty million, depending on the shoe company. The shoe company, wow. depending on how you you look of at course. revenue. Of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you being the CFO at one time yeah, will leave so, that alone. But <laughs> so I I decided, well, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is making. Twenty-five million dollars, and that's one racer, right? And that's the total revenue of this entire company with thirty-eight employees. Of course, you know maybe this racing thing is not you know, okay. something I should look at. So all right. I went over, and, and my friend's name is Piero. Piero was sitting in an office, a giant office with all these empty rooms, and there was a little desk in the corner, an office in the corner with a desk, and he was sitting there all by himself. And he says, "Alex, I need to fill all these offices with people. I have a budget." And we're going to grow this thing. We're going to take racing. We're going to put it on TV. Wow. And I was like, eh, I don't know about this. <laughs> he goes, well, you need to meet the owner. I okay. said, once you meet the owner, then you'll know. You'll understand. Like, yeah, that. whatever. Okay. So he goes, well, tell you what. Can Where you, is his do, office? Do you have the time? It's Newport Beach. Okay. Okay. Newport Beach. Just curious. So he goes, do you have a few minutes? I said, sure. Right. So he goes, oh, here, let's take a trip. So we get in a van. Uh-huh. We're driven to an airport, but not to like a terminal. Right. It's a little small private airport. Okay. 
Suddenly we're on a helicopter. <laughs> you were on a helicopter. Yeah, we get on a helicopter. <laughs> Why is this over like, This is from Newport Beach. Right. I, didn't, I had no idea. None of this I know, was going to happen. Saying, this was all just, like, just spontaneous. You thought it was a meeting. And I thought it was like, a meeting. Let's just go somewhere. I'm, next, I'm on a helicopter. And the yeah. pilot's like, hey, you want to steer? I was like, okay. <laughs> he did the dolphins. <laughs> I swear. Yeah, he's, he's like, he's good. Helicopter. Yeah, I'm you're the movie. most fortunate dude I know. That so, here, so, so instead of, so we're going to Catalina Islands. Okay. Right? But instead of landing on the island, there was this massive yacht. 165. Are you shitting me right now? 165 yeah. foot long yacht. Yeah. It was too big to dock at Kelly oh Island. God. So it was offshore. We right. landed on the yacht. Right. And then, and then I, you're then I meet then the owner. Mind, then I like, meet okay, the okay, owner. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this guy owns the racing company. Right. I was like, all right, this guy's legit. Right. I mean, if he's, he's got a yacht, he's not leasing there for a, a day to impress you. There's a full time staff of eight people that live on the yacht. Wow. They lived on the yacht. That was wow. their entire job. Who was this guy? I mean, other than his name, he yeah. was a real estate developer. He, okay, he, so he was a real estate developer. He was a real estate developer. Okay, yeah. Because I was thinking, if he didn't really have Core going yet, what did he do to make his money? So he was a real, real estate developer. developer. Okay. He bought Core. He had just acquired it, and he was moving it from the Midwest to California. Got it. And it's all this was all so new to me. I had no yeah. idea what was going on. I didn't know who the guy was. Yeah. I heard of him before. No, I just knew your friend. I just saw. All right, well, this shit's real. Right. right. You, you can't fake having a yacht in the middle of the, no. the harbor, you know, outside Kentucky. That's what I'm saying. A helicopter, helicopter taking this, there. This shit's real, yeah. so. <laughs> Just for you, I mean, the, I'm not, you're like, I'm cool, so, but I'm not that important to fly so, and rent this out. Yeah. So I met the owner, he was a very smart guy. Yeah. Um, interesting guy. Is very his name, like, covered private? You want to bring yeah, that up? Yeah, he's. That's fine. He yeah, ended up, in, in the long run, he ended up screwing a lot of people, oh, including okay. myself. Got it. Okay. He, he still owes me $132,000 okay. to this day. Yeah. And he really screwed a lot of people. So. You don't need to mention his name. No, but I got it. It turns out that his entire business was levered. Okay. Everything was on credit. Okay. And when the credit crisis hit in 2006 it, through eight, yeah, through eight, yeah. And he was invested in real estate. He blew up. And oh. When he blew up, everything he owned blew up. A ton of companies, including the company, the race company that right. I had then joined. Okay. And by then I was in it maybe four years or so. So you left. So I, I, I the joined, shoe company. I left and the shoe company in 05 company. and then okay. went over to Core, uh, the racing company in 2005. Okay. And then in 2008, it blew up okay. when the mortgage crisis hit because he was, he actually got a line of credit with Lehman Brothers. Right, right. And when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, his line of credit dissolved. dissolved. And this is what he I was funding. You, he was funding the business, yeah, yeah. Uh, the race business, with that line of credit. Okay. He didn't just, we didn't get a phone call like, oh, guess what? You know, we're closed. We all went to the office one day and doors were closed. He oh. had just dissolved the company. Yeah. It was like something out of <laughs> a movie where you just show yeah. up off the side and you're like, yeah, no really, job. Yeah. It was a yeah. very rude awakening. But if I'm not so, mistaken, because I remember meeting you and, and you were with Core at the time, you were talking about this racing and you were into it at the mm -hmm. time, right? Oh, yeah. so it was great. I, I became addicted instantly. So when that ended, if I'm not mistaken, your, your shoe company, you were on some kind of retainer or able to actually leverage some finances during while you were off, correct? Uh, like you had some kind yes. of, like, yeah, because at the time you were kind of writing books. I mean, so when did my, all that go into place? So my... Yeah, the book was actually, the main book was written after Core, not before. Okay, that's, okay. That's where we and got And I'm trying to figure out the that, timeline. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. So, but you did some wine writing, correct? Somewhere in the Core? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't remember. Yes, yes, because I had because you were parties during the Core days. Yeah, yes. this kind of like... Around 2006, 2007, Tammy and I wrote a wine book. Okay. Yes. One or two? You don't, one, one, one wine book. And that was on... On Merlot. Merlot's. So... Right. What, what came up with that idea and, and yeah, what... Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good story, actually. So in 2005... I just want to kind of like where that came from, you know. They say that 2005 was a phenomenal harvest in the wine industry for California, but both quality and yield. Okay. And so I thought, well, let's write, write a wine book. And right. buy all this wine and write it off, legitimately. Right. Yeah. And we went out and we bought every single bottle. Uh -huh. And, and, and it, there's a backstory here. There was a movie that came out at the time called Sideways. Yes. And the movie yes. Sideways... With Paul... Yeah. yeah, I can't remember his name. Giamatti? I, I don't yeah, remember yes, that, Paul Giamatti. Thank the, you. The movie was great, was but, great, but there's a one line in the movie where he rips on Merlot. Oh, Merlot, Merlot. And so the Merlot industry really took a hit from it. Oh, that. my God, really? Merlot's a great wine. Yeah, 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 it's like yeah, Cabernet. Yeah, you know, Cabernet yeah. and Merlot are very similar. Right. And so nobody was buying Merlot. All these new wine people who knew nothing about wine were right. just only buying Pinot because what he Because of that movie. I do remember that was his movie. Yeah. So Merlot sales, they tanked. Oh, and, uh, you kidding me? And it was awesome. It was perfect timing because... Right. 05 was a was a perfect harvest in California. Merlot prices were so low because right. nobody was buying but you Merlot. you could buy a bunch of Merlot. You, we yeah. bought every single yeah. Merlot that we could find. Yeah. Every grocery store, liquor store, online, wine.com, you yes. name it. If it was an 05 Merlot, we mm -hmm. bought it. 
over 140 of them, right. and we bought several bottles and we did wine tastings. And I was part of that. That's where yes, you and I yes. started to know each other, yeah. our families. We, we, we kind of the wine tastings. Late, but then we all did the little, uh, the, the <laughs> tastings together, and then that. that, and that the, so what was the book called? I can't remember. It was kind of a title. Right it's Everyday Reds. Yeah, Everyday Reds. That's right. So there I'm it is. Alex. My wife is Tammy. We created a company, TNA. TNA. That's TNA. right. We TNA. called it TNA Tastings. <laughs> TNA Every Day. And it's, uh, yeah. That was awesome. Merlots. It's, you can't buy it. We just made it for friends and sent it But out. you but, did sell it, right? A little bit or no? Oh, that's, we, that we wasn't that That's right. That's right. That's we, right. That was a fun weekend. thing. The only reason I bring that up is because here this guy is. He's kind of like in this in-between phase. And he just decides to start buying wine yeah, with him and his wine. wife. And, oh, let's just write a book. And to be honest, the book is actually well-written. I mean, it's actually got the ratings from your friends and oh, all we the offered, wines. Yeah, we got and, tickets to Zinfest after that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. People were bringing you, oh, sending God. you wines. We were yeah, 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 wine <laughs> fine. And you got to write it all out. I mean, that's the best part. <laughs> and the best thing is I drink whiskey. <laughs> well, he did drink wine for a while, and we are a wine cellar. Yeah, Probably yeah, built it for true. his wife, but he does enjoy wine. So, yes. go back to your, uh, your set the core. So you were in that for a while and you were working from home or was that a desk job? No, no. It was a, I live in San Diego and that was in Newport Beach. So it was okay. a computer job. Okay. I, but because, so I raised the money for core. Okay. I, I raised the money so that core could operate from sponsors right. and uh, help, you know, try to help a lot of the race teams out because like, race teams also need money. So right. I, I got to know a lot of the professional racers. Okay. I got to know most of the brands in racing right. through that experience. Right. And so when, when core dissolved, right. A That's lot funny. of new series were trying to emerge. Okay. Two actually went off at the same time. One of my friends, Tony Vanillo, launched the series. So did Ricky Johnson, from okay. Racer, right. a friend of mine. Yeah. And, and those two series ended up competing, trying mm -hmm. to get all the business from Core. Um, it was an interesting time because right. you know when you look at what you can learn from finance and Wall Street and right. how business should be operated right. versus how to create entertainment, racing was split. Some of the people in racing realized without spectators, mm -hmm. you got nothing. Right. You know, you, you need Whether spectators. It's online and or spectators in have to be or... entertained. Right. So you have to make racing entertaining. Mm -hmm. However, if it's too entertaining, like some races are just cheesy and, you know, obviously all, like Harlem Globetrotters right. are fun to watch, but right. it's not real. Right. So you, you can't have fake racing. So you have to keep racing legit and make it entertaining at the same time. And that's got a it. challenge. Right. Because Usually, money can buy you the better equipment. Got it. Yes. But money can't buy you a personality. Gotcha. It can right. buy you followers, perhaps. Right. That, that might not be real, but some personalities came out and right. they got big followings. And now that as the internet's growing, right. likes and followers and fans. Right. This and was before friends, all the, the Twitter Now this is all, all starting yeah. to become yeah. more yeah. important than it, right. is, than it was when we, we first started. Right. And so. There was this balance that I thought, like, you know, this is really cool. It's it's racing, like all other sports, right. is an entertainment, okay. but it's also professional. Right. And it can grow if the actors in it, in other words, if the racers, the drivers and the race teams, right. if they can grow. Right. So part of my job is to try to help them raise money so they can get more publicity, right. more media, okay. as we all get core more money. Right. And when it all dissolved, we were just like, whoa, what just happened? Right, right. Nobody okay. saw that coming. Right. I, I think 350 or so race teams wow. were all left... They, we core raced four out of eight races that season. Right. Exactly halfway through the season, it just dissolved. And, yeah. You know, we're all like, Oh, during oh. the race season. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like NASCAR, like getting the points and all of a sudden. And imagine being a away. racer and you get money from sponsors. Let's say you got $5 million coming from sponsors to race all season long. So right. you put the money into a team, you know, you build a car, you buy a, a better semi on it, right. you change all your wrap and your, and your, your livery, it's called your, right. your, oh, your race suit with your, yeah, with all the sponsors and everything. Yeah. And you race four races and all of a sudden, there's no more races. Right. Well, most of the sponsors won't have their money back. Oh, yes, because you, you only can't give them give half the money the season. Back. You yeah. can't give them money back yeah. because you spent all the money. Right. <laughs> so racers were screwed. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we, it was a really tough time. Wow. So I, I took a step back and I was like, well, let me see how this shakes out. Right. I don't know if Ricky Series is going to emerge or if right. Tony Series. Right. I, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Okay. I helped both. I helped them both. I introduced all of them to sponsors, but right. I decided I'm going to write a book. Okay. This, this really needs, this story needs to be told. Right. And so... The, and then another story at the same time was was the connection of racing with action sports. Okay. And I wrote a chapter in that book. The book is called Explanation. It's right. an explanation right. of the action sports industry. X play, yeah. X play. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, a nation that plays in X. Right. X games, Xbox, X Xbox, Extreme. That's right. Because X games was right there. So it was a plan of words. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the chapters I wrote was called Motocrossover. 
Okay. Because we saw action sports athletes from X Games and Supercross crossing over okay. into off-road racing. Right. There's a saying called, with age comes the cage. I remember you telling me about that. With age That's comes right. the cage. Ricky right. Johnson, Jeremy McGrath, right. all the Twitch, motorcycle Ryan guys, Deegan, Bobby all those guys. They handle a motorcycle so they're able to handle the car. Let's right. take another when, shot. When, when, when a racer turns, you know, 30, 40, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he gets off the two wheels, he just rides for fun now, that's but he gets into a car, four wheels, and that's what I use. That's our right. favorite, yeah. You know? So every day. That's right. our go-to, you know. Yeah, it's the cheaper so, one, it's still good. Still anyway, so yeah, so you you did that. I mean, that was my, that was like the prime of when I actually got the, you know, I knew, I saw you in action, you're writing this book, and then you kind of spun that off into like a, a speaking thing, right? Like where you oh, actually, God. you know, people were like, you, what you told me, and I, this is, I remember to this day what he told me. He said, mm. I'm writing this book to build credibility. So it'll actually get me uh, to be, like, actually have some knowledge in this. So whether it spins off to something better or whatever. But you wrote the first book, because there's two, right? So, so people who first meet you, they don't know anything about you. Right. They, they only know what they've been told by others. Right. Or perhaps by what is a, what's available online about you. This is exactly why I'm doing and this, by the way. Because people wouldn't know that just walking down the street. Or if you knew somebody that you have beers with. They don't know you like I know your story. I, mean, I spent a whole day at Port Irwin with uh, Vince Vince uh, Gilligan, the guy that did Breaking Bad, and I didn't even know it because I didn't know what he looked like. Right. <laughs> I spent the whole day with the guy and I didn't right. even know it. Right. It's like, huh. I mean, that's what I mean. Like, you wouldn't know. And I, I just find his story so interesting because he's my friend that a lot of people who know him, and Alex is well known in the community, don't know all this stuff. They just go, Alex. Well, what you do, you don't write a book for royalties or revenue from the book, although there are some. There's, there's enough of to course. really justify the cost. But you write it to teach people your mindset and your philosophy and, right. and what you're about. That's what so, you told me. It's kind of more so, like, so, yeah. It, it's like a resume that interested people will read. Okay. Not everybody reads anyone. Right. In fact, most people don't read anyone. Right. But the people who do read, right. they know that they're interested, and they're usually the smarter ones. Right. And if you can connect with them at an intellectual level because you're like-minded right. and agree with something in terms of, you know, the, the outview or the, the outlook on a on an industry right. or perhaps, you know, the way to increase productivity or efficiency and then yeah. something, if you have that same objective, then... Uh, a lot of good things can happen, right, right. And, and you can create new opportunities. Now, let's, so let's, when you when you right. have internet exploding, right. when you have social media exploding, right. when consumers are becoming the new marketers, mm -hmm. because marketing now is a lot more word of mouth than it ever has been. Of course. Best marketing in the world is word of mouth, but word of mouth can be you posting something to your community and friends right. on social media, and yeah, them seeing it, so and them sharing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So a book starts that. It, it gives you the, the base and the foundation from which you can start a discussion, right. or they get to know your, your sort of mindset. I saw that corporate America was coming into the action sports industry right, saying, right. we're extreme sports, we're here, we're cool. Yeah, yeah. And that's not the way you get in. I mean, right. Nike came in and started running ads in Skateboarding Magazine, and right. they got spit up and chewed out, right. chewed up and spit out right. because they did it all wrong. Right. Then they come back and then they sponsor... P. Rod, right. Paul Rodriguez, right. and now they're legit. now they're legit. And right. Now they're right. learning, right. and then they buy yeah. Hurley. So right. you know, now they're they're buying brands that yeah. understand the industry. They rethought it, yeah. And and that's really the way you want to do it. And so that's what the book Explanation was about. Right. It, it, it was my way to teach my friends on Wall Street yeah. how action sports were consolidating, right. and how action sports worked, so that perhaps investment money could come in right. to the action sports industry and then cross over mm -hmm. to motorsports. And in the book, I wrote a chapter called Motocross Over. Right. Motocross, right. motocross racing, and motocross over. over. Right, right. And I thought, I, I explained how the motocross racers are crossing over from X Games and Supercross. And you know what really irritated me is I sent the book to a friend at Transworld Magazine. Right. And I went, he was going to, Transworld, he was going to, he was going to review magazine. Transworld Business. Yeah, yeah. He worked there and he was reviewing the book. He showed a few other people. You know, they all liked it. Wow, this is great. They were going to review the book. Right. I have them. The next issue of Transworld had your chapter in it. The cover was called Motocross Over. Are you shitting me? They, they stole your they, idea. They, they, yeah. Oh they, my god! And it was, it just the name the, or the whole thing? 
the the front cover right. of their but they magazine. They just stole your head of that chapter. It said motor crossover. Oh my god! So whoever at Transworld right. saw saw, that. saw my book yeah. saw and goes, oh, that's a good one. Right. And you couldn't sue them? Nah, I didn't care. It was just, just at that time. It was a bummer. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It was a bummer because I thought it was a clever term that. It was obviously, or they wouldn't and, use. And to me, it means something because the true motocross over is when right. a two wheel motocross racer right. crosses over into four wheel Four-wheel. motorsports and right. races. Right. And there's a lot of that. Right. Like Ryan Beat races off road right now for right. Bill Stein. Right. He's you know, one of the, the fastest off road racers yeah. out there. Yeah. He's got championships. And That's awesome. He started with motocross. Right. They, they all do. And right. Anyway, but their body I, I thought it was down. clever when yeah, I came up with yeah, that, and then yeah. when, they, when they took the title, I was like, yeah, that kind of sucked. So let me but, ask you that then. So that spun off into a career, again, back to the corporate world, because you kind of were like, hey, I need... Well, one right. of the companies I wrote about was Lucas Oil. Okay. Because Lucas Oil at the time was doing it right, okay. and, and they were a big sponsor of CORE. Correct. They were, in fact, they were an entitlement sponsor for a while, and then they, they became the oil sponsor, and so... The guy that was running Lucas Oil called right. me up. As soon as he heard that they courted this all, he says, hey, come work for us. Right. I want you to do the same thing. Right. We'll take over the series. Yeah. I said, give me some time. Let me finish this book. Right, because you guys had time and taking the job. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. I told him, look, give me, give me four to six weeks. Right. It was almost six months. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it even more a while. Yeah. I was going to say, last time I checked, you were still home chilling and reading yeah. the book. Yeah. So he'd already hired someone to replay, you know, for that job. He's like, like, okay, but I didn't want when it. the book yeah. was done, I sent yeah. it to him. He right. read the book and he's like, come on over, work yeah. for us. And yeah. so I did. I, I worked at Lucas Oil until last year. Right, right. Doing the same thing. Right. But again, that was kind of a different, you were traveling, you were selling, you were yeah. trying to get sponsors from, uh, and what was Lucas Oil? What was their involvement? What were you selling? Like, so in marketing, what you want to do is you want to try to market your product when customers are having fun, and okay. when they're open to learning. Right. Look at it like this. Here's a story I'll tell. Um, you get up in the morning and you go into the living room and you're a single guy. Right. You, you make yourself a cup of coffee, all of a sudden, Mila comes out. Your right. wife is there, not, right. not your husband. Right. A couple hours later, the boys wake up. <laughs> I'll say four or five hours father. later, <laughs> around one o'clock, the boys wake up. Right. Then they come in, now you're a dad. Right. You know, let's say at, at some point in time, you actually go to the office. Right. You know? Now you're a professional. And then, right. you know, after work, look, perhaps you're still coaching Little League. Right. And then, and you know, maybe you drive the boys to school or something. Now you're a chauffeur. Right. Well, if you're Wilson Gloves or right. Slugger Bats, right. don't market to Ken Boone right. while he's an executive at the office. Market to him while he's a coach. Right. If you're Starbucks Coffee, don't market to the lover at night. Market right. to the, the single guy or in the, the morning. In the morning, yeah. exactly. So you something goes to early market, work. Yeah. Market to the man in the moment is what right. I say. Okay. And so racing, in racing, you can market to the race fan. Okay. You're not marketing to a executive or a teacher or okay. a construction worker or a lawyer or a doctor right. or a secretary. You're marketing to a race fan. Okay. So you can market to all of them. Right. If they have if they are a fan, if they right. have that connection of being interested in racing. So if you market to someone in the moment, then the marketing is more effective. And okay. and people are more open to learning when they're having fun. Right. People who go to, to local races, right. dirt races, off-road races, even motocross, big events draw in spectators who are there for the spectacle, mm-hmm. and they, they're there for the event. Okay. Like, you can go to a big football game, half the people might like football, the other half don't care, they just have never been to a football game. Right, right. Wow, this, this is really fun. Part of the they don't even know what's going on. Yeah. No, they don't, they have no clue. No, they're what just cheering when everyone cheers. You, you got season tickets to baseball. You yeah. know what it's like. I'm a, 90% of the people yeah. around you have no fucking clue what's right, going on. Right, they're sitting on their phones, right. not even watching. They're yeah. going they just want to be there. Yeah, exactly. You go to a small grassroots race, every single person there is vested in it. Because why would they go? They're Either they love it, or most likely they have a friend or family member who's racing. Right. So it's a real audience. Yeah. And now you have their attention while they're having fun. Right. So okay. what better place to sell an endemic product like tires, right. wheels, oil? Of course. And that's what Lucas they does. Lucas, they Lucas Oil creates events so people who drive cars and right. trucks right. are having fun at events and they need oil. So Lucas, Lucas, oil. Lucas creates, the program is called Team Lucas. Right. So I'm director of sales and marketing for Team Lucas. I work with a small group and we... We literally put on events and raised money from sponsors to throw those events. Okay. And then the money went to create television and market those events. Right. Very cool. And that's, that's what companies should do. So the, la- the next to last shot is Proper 12. This is a mm. whiskey that last year uh, Conor McGregor, the MMA fighter, actually created. He actually oh, teamed yeah. up. So He's I haven't actually had a shot. That guy. <laughs> Dude. That's actually really, that's probably my life. Like the that's most the smoothest one, yeah. for me. That's, that's by far the best one. I hate to say that because I like all the other ones, but that was extremely <laughs> yeah. smooth. 
Yeah, probably. This is Conor McGregor, really? Yeah, no, absolutely. I got it for me for a gift for my birthday. Yeah, that so. guy. Talk about a success story. Yeah, no kidding. So let, 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 let's wrap it up, wow. only because wow. we know that um, I want to give Alex some closing thoughts real quick. Um, Alex is no longer with Lucas, and I'll let him just kind of give him a chance to explain what he's doing now. Uh, if he wants to shout out or just give thanks to anybody or just let us know what he's doing now, that would be the greatest thing. And then we'll finish up with our last shot. So go ahead, Alex. What are you doing now that you're not with Lucas? The same thing I did while I was at Lucas. So, so Lucas <laughs> Oil owned and operated uh, a variety of different races. Um, at the time, there was a late model dirt racing series. There's a... A modified car racing series, there's a drag boat racing series, off-road truck series. Yeah. Um, some of those aren't around anymore, mm -hmm. but because racing, motorsports is sort of seeing a decline in attendance by youth. Okay. Although the irony is at the opposite end, simulated racing is, is on a rise okay. big time, okay. especially now with the quarantine. Right, of course. But um, instead of only selling for Lucas Oil, right. I'm now representing and helping and selling all racers and all series out there. So I created my own agency. So instead of being limited by one company and its series, right. any series that needs help, I right. can help them. So, right. so, so again, I only chuckle because that's what cracks me up about Alex. He's like, oh, I just don't want to work for a company anymore, so I'm just going to go out and just start... So, so look at that. I think it's the like, military. It's an army thing. It's like it's hard to, sit to stay still. for too long in one I've place. Never, yeah, yeah. I never was at the same school yeah. for more than a year ever yeah. in my entire life. So I just it's in my blood that I have to move on. Right, and I want to every wanna, few years I get into something I I gotta stop and, and change yeah. and do something else. And yeah. I don't if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? Fifty four. Okay, so I always say that because I'm trying to explain to the people out there that. You know, not every day you have to, I know when I was young, I'm like, you know, do I want to like be an entrepreneur? Do I want to work at a company? Do I want stability? Obviously, you sometimes can't control that route. And I actually have worked for an amazing company. So I really, you know, you know that. And I'm certainly not going to just like leave because I'm like, hey, but at the same time, I always admire Alex because he doesn't ever seem to give a shit. I mean, he does. He has a family he's responsible for, but he always knows that something's going to work on the other side. <laughs> cool. you know, I feel like you Look, always just... When I, when I left, so, so when I left Wall Street in 1998 yeah. to pursue the internet, right. I failed. Yeah. I blew up, lost everything. But the internet was not the wrong bet. Correct. I just didn't make it happen. You didn't understand at the time. Didn't make it yeah, happen. Yeah. The same thing is happening right now, in my opinion. Correct. We are in a world where you can sell a digital asset. My right. son Cole says, Dad, call it digital merchandise. It's right. not an asset. Right, asset right. means Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, all right, so to me, an asset is something that you can sell. Right. Anything physical. Of course. It's it is a, physical, yeah. it's a PDF file. It's a video. It's a song. Right. It's a download. Right. It's an e-book. Oop. Who writes books? I write right, books. Right. It's a, a subscription. Correct. Anything that you can do that other people might pay for and you can send it to them digitally right. or allow them access to it digitally, that's a digital asset. Right. We're in a world where you can sell a digital asset to anybody, anywhere, at any time, in any currency. Right. And make money. And make money. Right. You have no inventory, no right. overhead, no right. shipping costs. Right. All they do is click, and that's right. why Netflix, Spotify, right. all these subscription-based models are taking off. Right. We're in a world where if you create something good, you with this podcast, right. you're, you're creating a YouTube video, right. you're creating interest, one day you can monetize this mm -hmm. without ever having to ship a book right. or to wrap inventory right. or to buy inventory and house it and, and risk it. You, you can That's a long way to even though I appreciate that. You, you can create great, digital but, assets yeah, and you can put yeah. them online right. and if people are interested, yeah. and it's no longer people who are around yeah. you near the skate shop who come in the front door of Boca Samoa the skate shop and right. buy a deck. Right. Right. You can sell to anybody in the world with a connection. Yeah. I know. It's almost like Boca Samoa We are in this, I, I think that this opportunity now with our digital world of connectivity is, right. is as big if not bigger some people are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. Of course. It, it's as big or bigger than the internet revolution of the 90s. Oh, so yeah, all to, and, up to and, 2000s, yeah, when it was a big deal back then. That was one day deal. you're going to look yeah. back and say, gee, I wish I would have done something. You know? <laughs> right, right. And of course, we're on a pandemic, which we've never seen. 
And this is the, isn't this the greatest this refreshing the time in the world? <laughs> we're all getting the, to hang out and be like a part of oh this. God. Is obviously we're kind of the, the pandemic little... separates the doers from the donors. Right. You're out there creating a podcast. Right. You're creating these videos right. and podcasts. Yeah. And your wife, my wife is a Tammy podcast. is doing yeah. educational yeah. podcasts. Yeah. My son Cole's now doing podcasts on how to get into colleges. Yeah. I have friends that are creating assets. Brian Deegan, one of yeah. my friends, he's a motocross. Yeah, I mean, Brian Deegan's a huge motocross. He's out. He's, he was a poly yesterday. Right. And right. the kids were all talking because. Yeah. Brian's making YouTube videos, podcasts. Right, right. He's he's taking advantage of the opportunity. Right. Which I hope. And, and he's a doer. Yeah. You're a doer. There, there's doers and there's donors. Everybody I always, else is sitting back watching. And there's, I always feel like it's an opportunity for people to make masks. Like you look at the people who are designers who can't make clothes right now. Well, they're yeah, making masks. So I'm that, saying that's still another market that people are tapping into. So yeah, you hit on something I, I wasn't even thinking about, but we're entering a world, and this is my opinion, but I firmly believe this. Right. Where in the past, We're wrapping up soon. in the past, the the company or the group or the people with the most money and power had all of the might and they controlled the direction of what we did. And then wow. money had the power. Right. Today, influence doesn't come from money. Influence comes from followers who believe in you, mm -hmm. and anybody like Ninja, twenty-seven-year-old yeah. kid who plays, plays Fortnite, Fortnite <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. making twelve, thirteen million dollars right, a year. Right, right. And think about that. Yeah. Today, we're in a world where creativity right. is replacing money as the main source of influence. Wow. And everybody's creative. That's crazy. Who are the most underappreciated in terms of financial? rewarded financially rewarded people in the world they're creatives mm -hmm. most artists musicians poets right most dancers are average people like you and i that right. never make money from their skill right ever, right because they don't know how to monetize it right well that was in the old economy right in the new economy today the creative people will take over because creativity captures attention correct and as long as it's legit and it's real right. of course as as yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, People like to see things they've never seen before. Right, they like to right. hear things they've never heard before. Right. They like to do things they've never done before. Correct. So if you repeat a same old song, or if you just do what someone else has right. done, right. who cares? Who cares? You come up with same. something new. If yeah. you're creative, right. ooh, there's an interesting world. If you're creative and you can somehow put that creativity online right. and sell it digitally right. by having someone subscribe to it or purchase a digital print, a digital right. book in my right. case, I see royalties from my books coming in that's every what, month. That's another thing. I don't this do guy anything. just makes money from that, a book he wrote like that, five, six yeah, years ago. It's, it's crazy. It is crazy. And it you're really writing is. a book now. I'm right? going to write, write 4,000 books. But you are books. writing oh my book, God. right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So he's writing another books, book. So. He's got a couple books. I mean, this guy. I'm about, I'm about to publish a book called Marketing to Americans. Because, yeah. um, you know, about, I don't know, 40% of everything that we see touch in the United States is all made in China. Right. Name, a, name a Chinese company. I couldn't tell you. One, just one. Just name one. Name a Chinese brand. Sony. It's nice. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's my point. So there we go. That's Everybody, what I'm trying to say. I point. don't know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm writing a book with picturing a Chinese entrepreneur in right, mind. Right. And there are more Chinese entrepreneurs than there are American citizens. Right. That's <laughs> people people in the United oh States. Oh my God, that's insane. To teach them how to sell to American consumers or people with this mindset. Because, oh. you know, everybody wants to market to the United States with right. the highest GDP of, of all course. countries yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah. However, right. now that the world is connected, other countries are starting to follow our habits right, and patterns. Right. And so we're in another shift. If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. My yeah, dad right. still is telling me. Of course, me that's the definition of insanity. If, if you want to, <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. So, so, so you results so, by doing the same thing every every day. For the so you're still doing the same job, huh? After 20 years? Yeah, but my no, job changes. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. I still make a lot of money. No. We're in a world no, right I now. I didn't mean like that. No, he, he makes a lot. They pay me pretty well. No. Um, anyway, so we're going to wrap up, but I do love Alex's enthusiasm, and it's just one of the reasons why I brought him on the show. If you like this video, subscribe. We're going to do a last shot of Screwball, which is peanut butter whiskey, which is on the sweeter side, so we figured we could knock that out. <laughs> Reverend, <laughs> why did that one burn the most? I don't know. I went through my nose. <laughs> that's probably why. I actually, you know what? It's good to end it on a sweet one, though. Yeah, that that's why I figured. Cool. Because that that's a great idea. First, we wouldn't get a buzz. Yeah, true. This is a little bit nicer. That's a great idea. So thank you so much for watching, and we hope you guys continue to watch. Uh, this is episode two. I can't wait to watch all of these. <laughs> I really can. Yeah. And you
got, when you say Wine Wednesday instead of Whiskey Wednesday, yeah. you, whiskey, you, got, you just keep I know. I'm it. You guys saw that in the first episode. I'm he did not, it again. I did it again. I apologize. The ladies have a, a Wine Wednesday group. I'm going to say Whiskey in a minute. You call it Wine Whiskey. <laughs> I did. That's because <laughs> I have six shots. So, peace out. We love you guys. Subscribe, like the video. And hey, by the way, we're not doing anything super crazy, so you guys can just listen to this. You don't have to treat it like a video. You can watch it and listen to it in your car. Uh, get Alex's knowledge, and we thank you so much.